Welcome to Musicians vs. the World, the podcast where we explore aspects of music and musician life that may not have been covered in music school. I am your host, Christine Smith. Now, a few weeks ago, we started a series exploring neurodivergence in the world of music. And we've heard from researchers and performers and teachers all about the issues facing neurodivergent musicians. And hopefully, through these episodes, we have offered some support and education for them um, and for those who work with them. And so in today's episode, we're going to come full circle in our series of on neurodivergence with our guest, Dr. Shannon McDonald. Now, she's an avid researcher in the field of clarinet pedagogy, and she won first prize in the International Clarinet Association's Research Competition at Clarinet Fest 2021 for her research, Accommodating Learning Differences in the Clarinet Studio, Private Teacher Experiences, and Pedagogical Guide. And her article of the same name was published in the June 2022 edition of the Clarinet Journal. She's here to share some lessons from her award-winning research that will help teachers as they're mentoring students and helping them along their path and making music more accessible for everybody. A little bit more about Dr. McDonald. She's currently serving as adjunct professor of music at Texas Women's University in Denton, Texas. In addition to teaching at Texas, Texas Women's University, Dr. McDonald is an active clarinet pedagogue in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. She has presented research at many conferences, including the Society for Music Teacher Education Symposium and the National Association of College Wind and Percussion Instructors Conference. She is a member of the International Clarinet Association, where she serves on the Youth Committee, the Texas Music Educators Association, the College Music Society, and Pi Kappa Lambda. She resides in North Texas with her husband, her dog, and her three cats. I'm so glad that you're here, Shannon. Thank you so much for being here, and welcome to Musicians vs. the World. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm so excited. I have read through your pedagogical guide, and it is so thorough, and it is very um, specific to clarinet, but there's so many things that I think apply to all music and all music lessons. And so I'm really excited to have you come and share with us some of this research so that we can help teachers help their students. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. So as we start this, how did you get into music? What has made you um, decide to pursue a career as a musician? Um, you know, I started in band in fifth grade and and just always loved it and just kept going and got it degree, you know, a, a bachelor's degree in music performance. And then I took a lot of time off and did the real world thing. I taught mm -hmm. lessons for a while. I taught elementary and preschool music. I taught oh, fun. babies really like, uh, 18 month olds all the way up to eighth graders. Um, oh, and I wow. loved it. Yeah. I loved it. I miss, <laughs> I miss the toddlers the most, but, um, and then I, I had carpal tunnel in both my hands. So I, I stopped playing clarinet for like 10 years and yeah. Um, had surgery and was able to play again. So I started playing again and then decided to go back to school and get my master's. And then I was really inspired at that point um, and decided to go ahead and get the the DMA and uh, be Dr. McDonald. And, and I really <laughs> wanted to teach college and really enjoyed that experience. So that's kind of the long way I got there. Yeah. And so where did this... Um where did this passion for learning differences come in in all of that? My oldest brother uh, was adopted by my parents. He has um, pretty, they would say, severe intellectual disabilities. He okay. is in his 50s now, and I'm in my 40s. So, you know, he was around long, you know, long before I was. But my mom worked as a nurse, and at that time in the 70s, they called it an institution. Um, mm -hmm. and he, uh, he was a resident there. He was like five years old and they encouraged the staff to take home the, the kids that lived there on the weekends and stuff like that. So her and my dad, you know, took him home and pretty much, I think the story goes is that they'd bring him, she'd bring him back during the day when she was working and bring him back. And eventually they adopted him. And so I grew up not only just around him, but with individuals with all sorts of disabilities in the schools and the programs that he participated in. And I just, just have always had a passion for helping individuals that are 
neurodivergent in any way, shape or form, but it definitely stems from um, my brother, who's my favorite person in the world. (laughs) Now, does he like listening to you play? He does. He loves music. Um, He, yeah, he would listen to me play the clarinet and he'll wiggle his fingers like he's playing it, you know, and um, piano and guitar, anything I would get out like the guitar and we'd sing Christmas songs and he loves music just in general. And he's not um, able to actually play an instrument. His his cognitive development, I would say, is between three and five years old. Um, and oh, okay. yeah, and he has, uh, like physical limitations too. Um, so he, he wouldn't actually be able to play like a band instrument or something, but, um, yeah, he loves, always has loved all kinds of music. So. Yeah. So that's kind of where your passion. And then now with your research, you're kind of combining those two loves of yours. Absolutely. So when you were teaching, the little ones, oh, you said it was like eight months old, all the way up to eighth grade or something. 18 um, months, yeah. 18 months, that's what it was. So thank <laughs> you. Um, did you run into a lot of neurodivergent students when you were teaching? Absolutely. I taught at a Montessori school. And uh, so it was a private school. And a, there were a lot of students there whose parents um, knew that their their children needed more individualized help. And then... Um, so they often brought them to that school uh, instead of staying in public school for special education, for better or for worse. So um, there was a lot of that. And, you know, with the little ones, the toddlers, I mean, you have to be creative and do multimodal styles just to keep them entertained for 20 minutes, you know, it's of music. So yeah, there was a lot of that. And I really found while working there that the students that struggled the most academically, um, for whatever reasons, excelled in the arts almost always. They were fantastic. Maybe they couldn't read the notation, uh, but they could sing beautifully. And they just went from their classroom where they were frustrated to music where they flourished and loved it. And so I really some of those students kind of became my favorites. And I worked really hard trying to um, you know, make them feel special because, because they were struggling academically. Yeah. And music was a place where they could really shine. That was their spot. Yep. That was their spot. And I can see how, even if music is like their spot, I could see how lessons in traditional sense that are very structured can be difficult for someone who has a learning difference. And it always pains me. And makes me sad when I see someone who is obviously very musical, but is not succeeding in their music because their teachers don't know how to accommodate them. So I think that your research is really, really important for people to know. Um, Now, your research took you into a lot of different areas because you said there's a lot of research that's been done for public teachers, public music teachers, but yours is specifically in private teachers. Can you explain a little bit about what your research is and kind of what you found? Right. So there is a lot of research done for, especially in the last, you know, decade or so, uh, as we're kind of realizing that, you know, neurodivergent learners we can accommodate them and they can succeed. Um, so there's a lot in classroom management and, and classroom settings, but just not a lot for music uh, for music lessons. So that's where I wanted to expand on that. And so my survey, I, I surveyed just clarinet teachers mm-hmm. uh, at the time and just kind of what they had experienced, have they have students who had disclosed a medical diagnosis of some kind of learning disability or disorder or uh, medical thing like that, or if they uh, had experienced students that exhibited characteristics of some of these um, and maybe just didn't have a name because we are not within the school system. So we're not going to necessarily get that kind of information. I even had one participant in my survey say that they were told by the parent that their student had a learning disability, but didn't want to tell the the teacher what it was because they didn't want them to 
whatever, <laughs> you know, treat oh, them differently. Like, like stigmatized sort of exactly. thing. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, that really just handicaps the teacher because they could definitely accommodate them in the way that they learn best. So right. I, I took that the survey and the survey results and then um, made a pedagogical guide to how to address not just, okay, this child has dyslexia. How do we fix that? you're not going to get that information necessarily. So if you have a student who keeps flipping B and D on the staff, which is fairly common, Mm -hmm. okay, they may or may not have dyslexia, but they're definitely processing that visually um, differently and trying different things like color, use of color and things like that. Well, might help them. So if you just know how to recognize certain characteristics and then to apply techniques to help them, you don't need to know if they're dyslexic or not. You just see, oh, they're doing this. I can try this and see if it helps. So that was the kind of the point of the guide. Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of takes a little bit of the pressure off of the teachers that know you don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a therapist. Just if you see this problem, here is something you can do to like try to see if you can help with that specific problem. Absolutely. And I think that a student in public school would have an IEP or some kind of form where they would list out their disabilities and their accommodations. Whereas we don't have that, but essentially a private lesson does just that. We look at our students, see what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then teach to those strengths and weaknesses. So it's the perfect setting to to do that kind of thing. It's just, um, I, I think what we found, what I found through the survey was that teachers felt like students with learning differences could be successful as musicians, the majority mm-hmm. of them, but they did not feel comfortable teaching those students yeah. unless they had had training or experience. Um, So that's kind of where it is, is like, yes, I want to help them. I know they can do it, but I don't have the training. I don't have a guide or or any way of, you know, so that's what I was hoping to provide to these teachers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Was there anything that like really surprised you as you read some of these responses that these teachers gave you? Um, I think most... I wasn't surprised uh, as far as diagnoses goes that uh, anxiety and depression, ADHD um, were like our top, our top diagnoses. Um, I think in in general, as musicians, we're sensitive. Um, That's a a vast generalization. (laughs) But um, so the anxiety, depression definitely um, goes there. Uh, Dyslexia was well, let's see, one, two, three, four, was my fifth most, 41% of teachers had had a student who had disclosed dyslexia as a diagnosis, um, which is a lot. It's almost half of all of the respondents uh, in my survey. But very few teachers in the survey said that they had used color or color overlays in their lessons, which is a go-to accommodation for, uh, individuals with dyslexia. So that showed me right there. Okay. We're, we, we're seeing this and we need to address it. Um, we all learn differently. We all have different learning styles. Um, and it's like the old thing of like testing a goldfish on climbing a tree, you know, that's, that's not, that's not going to (laughs) work. So why not, use what this student is the way they learn and help them learn that way. So if they're a visual learner or a kinesthetic learner or whatever, we can help them learn better by just using those, utilizing those things and the disabilities and things go along with that. I had a student, uh, a college student who talked to me. She has not been tested and did not know if she had dyslexia, but she suspected it. And she, Mm -hmm. she would flip um, B's and D's and A's and C's, which is a good indication. Uh, and there were some other music reading issues. And so I was like, well, let's try, let's put your music on colored paper. So we photocopied it onto, I think lavender is the color we had in the office. So that's what we used. Uh, Mm -hmm. and it worked really well. So she asked her theory professor to do the same for her test. Cause typically when she would take a theory test, she would take it and then he would let her kind of leave 
kind of take a second, come back, check over it and turn it in. She was getting like C's on her tests and she's very strong Mm -hmm. in theory. So the first test she took after they put it on colored paper, she got an A. Really? Yes. So, yeah. And just because she wasn't making mistakes just in the way that she was seeing it, it's something about, I'm not a doctor, medical doctor or scientist, but it's something about the white background with the black lettering that just confuses the, the way Mm. that they process that information. And it's such an easy fix. It is an easy fix. And I think that there, I think one of the reasons we've been doing this series about neurodivergence and the thing that I've learned the most is that I think as parents and as teachers, we have to be careful to realize that these differences, these learning differences aren't necessarily, they don't make you bad. They don't make you worse. It's just something you have to adjust for. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with letting people know, hey, I can do this. I just need to change things a little bit to make it work better for me. Like, Absolutely. I mean, it's like having my little tiny sixth grader with little tiny fingers use a neck strap because it's hard for her to cover the holes because her hands are so small. I mean, you don't think twice about that, but, but when it comes to the way that information is processed, some people are, well, we do it this way and that's the way we've done it forever. And, and well, there's flaws in that system. We've had so much more research into how the brain works and things like that, that, you know, that let's, let's help everybody be successful. Right. And I think it also, you have to figure out as a teacher what your definition of success is. Like, are you wanting to fit all of your students into one mold and have them all learn the same? Or is your ultimate goal to make musicians out of them and give them a lifelong skill and passion and help them with their overall, you know, just happiness and quality of life, right? Absolutely. That is a hundred percent true. I love that. I love the way you said that. And I I had a a middle schooler that I don't know. I I think she mentioned to me that she had special education is the only reason that I could confirm that she had special education, but I don't know why or what it was for. But I know that she had a really hard time focusing on anything (laughs) for a, for any amount of time. Uh, and I also know that she, if I asked her, Hey, do you want to play this now? Well, most students would take that more, most neurotypical students, I should say, would take that as, okay, we're going to play this now. And I would say to her, do you want to play this now? And she'd go, no. (laughs) And I'm like, okay, I need to like re (laughs) read. (laughs) Yeah. So I was like, we're going to play this now. So even things like that. And with students who a lot of times students with autism spectrum disorders, don't get tone of voice and those kind of implications. And so you have to be very literal when you're talking. Um, But yeah, it became very clear very quickly that the goal for her was for her to uh, enjoy playing and to make progress in her own way. So I threw the blue Rubank book out the window on that one and focused on songs that she knew because she would shut down immediately unless it was like, oh, I know this song. And then she would want to learn it. And she was still learning the concepts, but it was in a way that worked best for her because otherwise she just would lose attention. And we would flip around a lot where we'd work on this song. And as soon as I saw her slipping out of attention we would move on to something else and then we'd come back to it or things like that. So you just have to be ready to be creative. And like you said, we're not going to fit everybody in a box and that's okay. Music is the kind of thing where we can just, it it, it can be any level from professional to I'm doing this just because it's fun. Right. Right. And knowing what their goals and what their parents' goals are is I think key like I think just the most communication that you can have with a student and with the family so that everyone's on the same page makes all of these accommodations so much easier. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's go into them a little bit. Um, I like how you arranged all of your guide. There were um, like four different like large categories that had individual sort of differences and learning differences in them. Um, we had behavioral and emotional characteristics learning disabilities and processing disorders, sensory impairment and sensory sensitivity, and then physical orthopedic disabilities. Um, 
can you kind of explain those categories and maybe some of the some of the issues that are in them that go that your uh, guide goes over? Yeah, the so the first one, behavioral and emotional characteristics. These were the characteristics that the survey participants reported most often seeing, which of course it's easier to see if a student is distracted than it is to know what's going on in their brain. Uh, But they are like being easily distracted, being anxious, performance anxiety, short attention span, restless, moving around, um, even being shy or unable to uh, engage in conversation or respond uh, verbally. Mm -hmm just doesn't like to talk. Um, I, sometimes Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm like pulling, you know, (laughs) pulling words out of my students. (laughs) And so those would be the behavior emotional, um, and they can tie into so many different disorders. So you can't just go, Oh, well, they're easily distracted. So they have ADD. Well, maybe, or maybe they have anxiety. Um, or maybe they just didn't get good sleep last night. You, you will run into these things with every individual probably at least once. And it doesn't mean they have a disability, but if you already know how to accommodate it, you have that student who comes in one day and is just all over the place for whatever reason, you can still have a productive lesson if you just know how to accommodate that. Yeah. Um, I would love, what is your advice for the very, very shy, very quiet student? I was so excited when I actually saw that in the guide, because I think every teacher runs into the extremely introverted student. What were some of the advice that you had for that? Yeah. So sometimes it's because they just process things more slowly. So you're expecting them to respond very quickly. Um, So giving them some time to respond to a question, that sometimes that will help. Um, Sometimes they just they are either nonverbal or not comfortable talking. You can let them write their answers. You can use, um, I love, I do this with my, my fundamentals of theory class in college. I laminated a bunch of staff's paper and a uh, dry erase marker. And it's for classroom. It's great. Cause I can say everybody write a perfect fourth interval and they can hold it up and I can go, Oh, okay. Who's got it? Who doesn't, you know, oh, but great same, idea. yeah, same thing. I, I totally got that from someone else. I didn't come up with that one, but I <laughs> utilize it. So <laughs> I don't want to take credit for things I didn't come up with, but, um, you can do that in your lessons too. So if you want them to respond by writing down or writing notes or things like that, um, what's, you know, what's in the key of G, they could just write it. If they're just not a, a person, let them respond with gestures, let them make, um, make picture or word cards. If they're, especially if it's a nonverbal student, let them point to things, um, to communicate anything they need, keep them on the music stand, Um, things like that. If, if they're just shy and they don't talk, I just, um, you know, we just keep going and I try to check in with them and I'm like, the first thing I I say, you know, when they come in, I was like, how's band going? Do you still like playing the clarinet? Is it fun? (laughs) Like we have a little, little check-in moment and I I'm getting there. I have one in particular where I, I was like, oh, she doesn't like me because she's just very like, you know, closed off. Yeah, um, I know what you mean. <laughs> yes, but lately it's it, she's starting to break that shell. So I think it just takes time with some of them and you just have patience is the biggest thing for any any teacher, right? <laughs> right, right. And then I think as you break down that, you know, that wall and seeing them starting to trust you, you can – it's amazing the switch in their lessons and how much they become so much more expressive and how their music just opens up because you're that trusted person in that trusted space where they can. Absolutely. I mean, I think anxiety as someone who had has anxiety and I've had anxiety my whole life, like most people, but grew up in a time where it wasn't necessarily diagnosed, especially in children. And now I can look back and go, Oh, that's why I was like that. (laughs) But you know, these kids, there there could be kids who have anxiety and they just, I mean, that was one of my things I would do is just like not talk and just, you know, don't look at me, don't notice me kind of thing. So just making them feel comfortable and not forcing the issue. If they don't want to talk, they don't have to talk. 
just let them play and you play and make some music together and, and they'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Patience is, is the biggest one. It's like the, the patience is a virtue, I guess. Right. It's the old <laughs> adage, is. right? All right. <laughs> so, um, and then the next level or the next, uh, big group is learning disabilities and processing disorders. We kind of talked about these a little bit, but what are some of the, what are some of those disorders that your guide covers? Besides dyslexia, which is the most common, um, the dysgraphia, which is a writing, it's kind of like, from what I understand, it's like students have really messy handwriting or just processing. They can process the information, they can tell you the information, but when it goes from brain to paper, writing it down is an, can be an issue. Um, dyscalculia, which is a math uh, learning disability. Um, I have a student, a music theory student, who has uh, told me that she has dyscalculia and math. Um, it's very, yeah, nobody has really ever heard of it. I had never heard of it until I started researching. But she really struggles with, um, with rhythms and intervallic distances. Uh, mm. and that's, it's not just math, but if you think of math, you think of like spatial awareness as well. So just distance and gauging that, like saying, will that desk fit in that area? That's, that's a spatial thing. And I mean, I'm not very good at that either. I always have to ask my husband, <laughs> is that, <laughs> that looks too big. He's like, no, it's fine. And he's always right. But I can't tell. Um, but she's really, and I'm really trying to come up with different ways to, to help her succeed as a music major. Um, yeah, and that's what's that's hard. Impressive. That's yeah. impressive that she made it all the way to a music major having trouble with that. Right. Um, I mean, being a vocalist, I think it helps because Mm -hmm. a lot of that is rote. You know, you can you can pick up on that a little bit more easily than maybe an instrumental. But yeah, it's it's definitely a a struggle. And, you know, she if there therein lies the issue with um, can they be successful educators if they struggle with this? And, you know, my opinion is always yes, because I'm an advocate for neurodiverse. But I actually went to her music education teacher and said, how is she doing in her ed classes? Does she have, do you think she has a promising future as an educator? And she, absolutely, she's great. She's do, getting A's in my classes. She's she's going to be, a, she could be a good educator. And so that in turn makes me try even harder to find ways that it will work for her. Yeah. That's impressive. That's really <laughs> incredible that she can do that. I know. Absolutely. And, yeah. And I think that's something that, that a student like that may not realize. They just always feel like they, they just can't keep up with everybody else. So, which is another thing that I like to advocate, um, especially in, college where nobody's checking up on you and saying that student should be tested for this. Go to this, dis, uh, register with dis, your disability services office, get accommodations. Don't think it's a bad thing. That's the way you learn. That's the way your brain works. Get them. If you need extra time on your exams, if you need a distraction-free environment, um, things like that, why not utilize that? That's, yeah. you know, in the real world, you can get those things, <laughs> you know, you can That's just true. set up your job that way so that you don't work, you know, that it's silly to think, oh, well, that's not going to happen in real life. Well, sure. Why not? You can use a calculator. You can have, you know, a spell checker, things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. I think that's really great that people are starting to create awareness of this so that students know to go and get help and to realize that they can have these accommodations. And I love it that there are those accommodations because even 10, 20 years ago, I don't feel like we would be having this conversation. Really. Absolutely not. That's a great thing about how this is all becoming more normalized. Um, and, and it's not a bad thing. It's not, a, there's not a stigma now. Um, 
you know, when we were in school, it was it was very different with special education versus nowadays. I think the the figure was eighty uh, percent students in special education spend eighty percent of their time um, in general ed classrooms. So oh, wow. for the most part, they're in general ed classrooms except for in, you know, a small percentage, but it was the majority mm-hmm. of students in special ed. And that most definitely includes music classes. If mm-hmm. if the special education teacher is going to send them somewhere, it's going to be band, choir, general music, things like that. So um, that, and that's great. That's, that's, I love that. I have a friend who is a special ed teacher and we've talked about this, you know, to no end about about that and how, you know, she, like her, she'll take her students to the band room just to listen because she had an in, uh, inclusion classroom. So it was, they were there all the time. Um, but she would take them just to listen because they loved music and just visit the band room and tap on the drums and things like that. So any kind of exposure to music is, is great, but most of, most of the students are gonna, you're gonna have them in band and orchestra and, choir and you know they may continue into college if you teach college so yeah well kind of going along with that the next level of your of your guide talks about sensory impairment and sensory sensitivity and um the one that caught my my eye on that one was people who were overly sensitive to sound and something simple as putting in earplugs in rehearsal like what an easy way to have someone still enjoy music. <laughs> I mean, I would wear, I, I play the piano. And so sometimes in rehearsal, I'd find myself next to the French horn. So I wore earplugs anyway. It's not like, <laughs> it's, it's not a, a stigma, but what an easy way to have someone still be able to participate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I played bass clarinet in front of the percussion section for a Mahler <laughs> symphony. It was oh my yeah, goodness, <laughs> const, constant like, okay. Um, but yeah, that's an easy one. And they have musicians earplugs that are, you know, that we've all used in that situation to tune out, you know, those frequencies. Um, so we don't damage our hearing, but it right. works just as well for that. And you know, that, that is an easy one to spot in younger kids because I've had I've had many in the younger music classes that were like, Miss McDonald, it's too loud in here. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, oh, okay, you know. sweet baby. Yes. <laughs> so things like that. I mean, in a recorder classroom with a, a child like that, I mean, you have to. You have to let them yeah. wear earplugs because. Oh. Yeah, a recorder class, yeah. I mean, you want to wear them <laughs> for that, that's for sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, But yeah, that's a simple way to do it. Or, you know, on clarinet playing in the super high range, prep them for it. Okay, we're only going to do this for a short amount of time or whatever. You know, this is going to be loud. Um, I, you know, read in my research that some different kinds like using earphones as opposed to like a speaker, depending on the kind of sound, um, they prefer a certain way. So let them listen to recordings. Uh, Okay. Do you want to use your earbuds or do you want to hear it on the speaker? Things like that. Yeah. And then I also thought an interesting one was um, smells can overstimulate some students. Absolutely. And so just the fact if they can smell, you know, your dinner cooking, if you teach out of your own home, that can be distracting. And so you have to try and um, if you have that student coming, you have to just like kind don't of cook just dinner check, then. <laughs> yeah, check your smells, you know. <laughs> but it's a real thing. I, I never even thought about some like I never thought about how the environment of your studio and of your teaching studio can really affect a student. Right. And and like the ticking of the clock, uh, which I put as an example in the easily distracted, you may not even notice it, but someone else that's all they would hear is the ticking of that clock and that's an easy fix and some people could be you know could say well I mean why should I have to you know not cook dinner when my student comes well or you could just have that student be frustrated every time they come and not be an effective teacher like what's easier yeah yeah Yeah, exactly well it's also it's like your career and you want to make your career successful and yes if just cooking your dinner a half an hour or an hour later does that then and do that and I think uh, sometimes we forget that as teachers we're there to serve the students that's that's yeah. our job it's not 
they're not there to, you know, accommodate us in any way. We're there to serve them. And in order to serve mm-hmm. them, we have to make accommodations to make it, make them be able to learn that that is best for them. So, yeah. Yeah. I think I just, that, all of that, the sensory one really surprised me because I was not aware of how my environment works for me, but we c- there are small changes that I can do when there is someone who has sensory issues. Absolutely. Even clutter, clutter can, yeah. I mean, it makes me crazy. Don't, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I, <laughs> I can get cluttered, but there comes a point when I'm like, I have to clean this up or I cannot be productive. Right, right, right. And so if you come in and yeah, I, I totally get that. <laughs> and then the last group is the physical orthopedic disabilities. Um, and I thought this is a very important one because injury is a huge problem that we have to be aware of. Yeah, musicians' and, health is huge. Right, 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 right. And um, I like what you said about the neck strap. Um, mm-hmm. I thought that was a really good one. Um, what other what other sort of things can you do? Or is there something that's, that teachers should just kind of be watching out for? Or, you know, what are some, what are some tips for teachers in that area? Yeah, I mean, in general, I, just noticing tension in your students. Um, I have one that I just noticed this with, and, and he's a seventh grader. And I'm like, he's so, te- like his shoulders are, and I'm like, relax your shoulders. And he plays so much better when he does that. He just, yeah. you know, especially technical stuff. Um, and I just never noticed it before, but he's you know all up here. So um, looking for things like that, when they're in pain, have them stop. Back, you know, back in the day when we, you know, we were learning, it was pushed through the pain. And I think we're now getting to a point as musicians where we, and in other, you know, worlds too, but that it's, no, you need to stop, recover. And that can be really scary, but you're not, you're going to end up with carpal tunnel in both your hands for 10 years like I did. Um, because I didn't know, I was like, oh, I don't know why my fingers are numb, but they are. And I just kept playing and, um, yeah. And then waited forever to actually do the surgery, which, uh, was, you know, once I had it, I I was like, oh my gosh, my life is, there's a game changer, but things like that. I've had students who have issues and, you know, can't play for a while. And we just do other things. I had a student have, um, an issue with the, I forget what it's called, like de Quervain's syndrome or something, but uh, an issue with the ligament in her thumb. And so she had surgery for it, but uh, the kickstand, I don't know if you saw that in my guide. Yeah, it just hooks to the thumb rest of the clarinet and balances on the chair. And so it's completely not weight bearing. And after she had surgery, she couldn't, she could move her hand, but she couldn't bear weight for a certain amount of time. So she used that. She still uses it almost all the time, even though she's recovered, because it just really helps um, yeah. in general. And so a lot of people would see that and be, you know, what, oh, what is that? That's weird. Even there are some teachers, clarinet teachers, who don't want you to use a neck strap. And, and why? If it helps, yeah. it helps, you know? Yeah. Um, so that one and um, what are some of the, uh, oh, with other instruments even, they hold, you put your like trombone or trumpet and it clips in and mm-hmm. fits onto a, I think it's like a snare drum stand or a microphone stand, one or the other, and it holds the instrument. So all you have to do is move the trombone slide or do the valves. And so- oh, that's amazing. Yeah, you- have, uh, back problems or you had surgery on one arm or you can still keep playing. I had a a student at, at the college that through her teacher who knew that I did this research emailed me saying, I'm having back problems. It hurts when I hold my trombone. And I sent her the link to that device and she bought it. And you know, that, that solved everything. So, uh, just being creative. There are so many different I mean, go to your repairman and say, my student can't do this. I mean, they have a one-handed clarinet that's fully chromatic uh, in the full range of the instrument. It's amazing. It's by Peter Worrell, um, and it's it, it's amazing. And you can play it with uh, also with, I think it's a microphone stand. And so you mm-hmm. only have to use one hand. Um, 
Isn't that Dave, amazing? Wow. David, David Nab, I think is his name. And he's a saxophone professor, I think at Nebraska. Um, and he, he had a, uh, something where he lost the ability to use one arm. And so he had a saxophone made, uh, for him and he's still, you know, performing and teaching and is successful, but you're only limited by your creativity and your repairman's ability really. So, <laughs> well, this is incredible. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all of this information with us. Like there's, and we just barely even scratched the surface of your guide. Where can people find it? They can find it on my website, uh, which is Shannon McDonald clarinet.com. So McDonald MCD, like the burger place. <laughs> um, <laughs> Going to my website, going to education tab, and then under accommodating learning differences, you can find mm-hmm. the the guide there. Yeah, and I encourage everyone to go and and read it. Um, there are so many different things and so many useful ideas that I think are useful not only for teachers but for professional musicians as well, or anyone learning or students. Like, there's all of these. There's so many things to think about, and also your research is on there too, right? So people yes, can my entire. Research. DMASA is on there as well. Yeah, it's just, it's just fascinating. So um, just to finish up, do you have any last minute advice for aspiring musicians? They can be neurodivergent or not just any last little words of encouragement or advice. I think just be kind to yourself and realize that everybody is going to struggle with something, whether it's a neurodivergent thing or not you're going to struggle with something. We all have our thing and just be patient with yourself and measure your progress against yourself from year to year and realize that you are improving no matter what. Don't compare yourself to the person next to you. It's all about what you are doing and how you are improving as a musician. So just compete with yourself only. I love it. Thank you. Yes. That's fantastic advice. So Dr. (laughs) Shannon McDonald, thank you for being here. It was such a joy to talk with you and to discuss this important topic with you. So thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank you so much for having me.